Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. But, uh, you know, there's some people in life who have what you might call an affinity uh, towards stray animals, okay, strays. And, of course, some of them are more focused on cats. How many cat lovers do we have here this morning? Okay, that's not a crime. Um, And so some people, if they see a a stray cat, a homeless cat, uh, they just cave in, end up bringing it home as a pet. There's some people like that. Of course, there's other people who are more partial to dogs. How many dog lovers do we have? Okay. Seems like the dog lovers outweigh the cat lovers, but that's okay. And uh, some folks, they love dogs so much that whenever they come across a neglected or stray dog, they embrace it and bring it home as a member of the family, right? Some people are like that. Uh, Cats, stray cats, stray dogs. Well, you know, uh, Clarice, my wife, Uh, For her, it's neither of those. It's not cats, it's not dogs, but rather her area of weakness, believe it or not, is sick and um, dying plants. Okay, now I know that sounds a little odd, but uh, it really is. She has a real affinity for sick plants, and I just happen to have one of them right here. Um, You might say, yeah, it does look sick, but you should have seen it like a year and a half ago. Um, Actually, this plant was uh, growing in the foyer of our church. It was in a far larger pod at that time. And um, what happened was uh, over the course of a year, I don't think it was COVID or anything like that. Um, This was pre-COVID. It just kept getting sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker until finally it just dried up and died. I mean, to me, it was dead. And yet, rather than throwing it out, because I thought, well, you know, there ain't no hope for that thing. We'll just throw it out and uh, get another. You know, Clarice, actually, she loaded it in her car. It wasn't her car. It was her truck, actually, because it was in a big pot. Some of you might remember those plants out there. She brought it home, and she began an intensive um, program of revitalization. And she repotted it, she pruned it, she cultivated it, she fertilized it, she even sang and serenaded to it. Um, No, not really, but I thought I'd throw that in there. They say singing to plants does help them. I don't know, I've never tried. Um, I think if I sang to a plant, it'd probably die for sure. Anyway, sure enough, over time, as you can see, it began to grow. I know some of you are saying, well, it doesn't look great, but you should have seen it before. It began to rally and sprout new growth. It really is amazing uh, because um, when she brought it home, I thought anything uh, apart from a divine intervention is is not going to do anything for this plant. And so sure enough, because of her love, her persistence, her uh, hope and care, Uh, This plant has a new lease on life. It really does. And, um, you know, the more I thought about that, um, Clarice's gift of reviving sick and ailing plants, uh, the more I began to realize just how biblical of a concept that is. It really is biblical. In fact, it's so biblical that Jesus devoted an entire parable to it. And um, that's what we're going to look at this morning, uh, the parable of the revived plant. And so if you have your Bibles with you, either turn them on or turn them to Luke 13. And we're going to be starting in verse 6, Luke 13, verse 6. The scriptures will come up on the screen. Um, But you see it here uh, in Luke 13, verse 6. It says, and Jesus also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? No fruit. It's useless. It's wasting valuable space. But he, and this is the uh, gardener, said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it and it bear fruit well. Um, But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Okay, and so here we have the story of of a man who went out and planted a tree, 
uh, with full expectations that it was going to do what every normal and healthy tree does, and that is bear fruit. But we see here, after waiting patiently for three years, and that's a long time, three years, uh, there is no fruit. It's not bearing anything, and so the man says, enough is enough. This, true, this tree isn't doing anything. And so uh, he tells his gardener to cut it down and throw it out because it's taking valuable space. Of course, the gardener had a very different kind of attitude towards the, the unproductive tree. And he says, I'll tell you what, let me wait w one more year. Let's, let's give it some time. Let, 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 let me dig around it. Let me add some fertilizer. Let me give it some extra love and care and see what happens. And if it's not fruitful by then, then uh, I'll take my ax and I'll get rid of it. Uh, that's the parable. And let me just say, if Jesus was just giving a lesson here on gardening 101, in other words, tips to good gardening... I guess we could all close our Bibles, go home, and start working on ours, although it is kind of cold right now. But um, if it was just a parable about how to have a good garden, then um, it doesn't have all that much significance for us. But how many of you know this parable has more to do when, with just good gardening practices? But in fact, it, it is a powerful lesson. Uh, a lesson in how God chooses to bring a greater measure, and I want you to hear me this morning, a greater measure of healing and health and wholeness and fruit in our lives. How many could use a little, a little stand a little bit more fruit in your life? Amen. See a bit more fruit uh, in your marriage, your family. Um, this, that's really what this parable is all about. Healing, wholeness, and fruitfulness in our lives. And uh, I want to talk about that. In fact, today we're beginning a brand new series we call Wholehearted. Practices for Living Healthier and Happier Lives. Uh, that's what this series is all about. I'm excited about it. Uh, every Sunday it's going to be a little bit different because we're going to be introducing a different practice. But the practice that I want to introduce to you today has to do directly with this parable here. And I'm going to unpack it for you. And so how many here are ready to learn a few things this morning? You're ready. You've had your coffee. You're, you're engaged um, turn to the person next to you and say, God never gives up on you. Just tell them that. It, never. If you're watching online, type it in the feed. God never, he never gives up on you. And so, you know, the first thing I see here um, in, this, uh, in this parable is uh, what I call the expectation of fruit. That's exactly what the vineyard owner had, that he planted a tree with, the, what, the full expectation that over time it would um, produce some healthy and abundant fruit. He expected fruit. Of course, that's not very different from any of us. We look at our lives, right? Uh, we look at all the branches and leaves, the shoots and the uh, sprouts of our lives, and we expect to produce good fruit. We expect to produce long-lasting fruit. We have a desire to pr produce abundant fruit. That in my marriage, I want to bear some fruit. Uh, that in my family, I want to see a great harvest take place. That in my education, my career, my relationships, I want to see some real positive growth. We are expecting fruit in our lives. And whether it is in the area of our habits, our thought life, the choices we make, our own health, physical health, mental health, our goals, even our relationship and walk with God, we have this natural drive. You might call it a hunger, a propensity to be healthy and effective fruit bearers. Where does this come from? God puts it in us. I mean, Jesus said it himself in John 15, 16. You did not choose me. I chose you that you should go and bear what? fruit. I chose you to be fruitful and that fruit should remain. It's normal and natural to expect fruit to appear in every single area of our lives. And yet just like in this parable, sometimes uh, there seems to be a massive gap. That's the best way I can say it. Uh, between what we expect, our expectations and what we end up experiencing. And so I call that the, um, 
the reality of my barrenness, right? Uh, that we want uh, to see fruit, but we don't get it. It doesn't seem to come. Um, you know, very practically, I want to be a better husband and a wife, but many times we're not. The fruit's not there. I want to be a, a, a loving, wise, understanding parent, but oftentimes we're not. The fruit's not there. I want to be a better student or a boss, an employer, a neighbor, a leader, a friend. I want to be a better Christian. How many times have you ever prayed that prayer, right? And yet the fruit's not there. Despite all our good and noble intentions, the fruit that we are hoping to produce, to see in our lives, doesn't appear. And uh, we find that there is a big gap, expectation of fruit and then the reality of our own barrenness. And it's at that point that someone steps into our story uh, the same someone we see in the parable, and I call that the judge, the assessment of the judge. And um, that's who the landowner was. And that judge says the very same thing that the landowner said in this parable. He says that this tree is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not performing the way it ought to perform. It's unresponsive, unproductive, it's faulty, it's flawed, it's defective, you fill in the blanks. And so the only recourse is, uh, please take your axe and cut it down. That is the assessment of the judge. And let me say that that judge right here, um, he or she comes in many facets and forms, okay? The judge. Um, that judge has a way of showing up in many different places in our lives. Uh, sometimes that judge comes in the form of a person. It could be a parent. And that was all they told us. You're not producing. You're getting D's. I want you to get A's. It can be a parent, it can be a teacher, it can be a boss, a spouse, a friend who speak very harshly and critical words over us that, hey, I was expecting more from your life and you haven't been producing it. What is wrong with you anyway? Right? When are you going to get your stuff together anyway? It's the voice of the outward judge that comes at us from all directions. And uh, if that isn't bad enough, um, we have to wrestle with all kinds of other things, and that is not only voices from the outside, not only does the judge live on the outside of us, but what makes this really difficult is many times the judge lives on the inside of us, and I think we all know what that voice sounds like. It's a voice that keeps echoing over and over in our mind, right? That I'm a failure, I can't do anything right. I'm a loser. That's all I'll ever be in life. I call it the chorus of all the knots that keep going over and over in our heart and in my mind. What are the knots? It's all the things we're not. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not healthy enough. I mean, you fill in the blanks. I'm not ever enough of what I need to be because I just don't have the fruit to show it in my life. It's the voice of the judge. And I want you to think about that in your own life because I don't have to say how many of us have it. We all have it. Maybe a better question is how intense is it in you? How loud is that voice going on inside of you? Because the fact is, is that if we allow this to go on long enough, we will, the, the, these are our two options, we will either give up all together and say, God, why don't you just cut me down, take me home, we'll slip into a state of futility and hopelessness. That is one thing that'll come out of it. Or we will find the strength to rally and enter into the next stage of this, and I call it the um, reinforcing of our efforts. Okay? That we say to ourselves, you know, I got no fruit. The judge is criticizing me because of it. And so I'll fix this thing. 
I'll fix it. I'll work harder. I'll pray longer. I'll think smarter. And I'll live healthier. Come hell or high water, I am going to be the kind of person that God expects me to be. And so with fresh motivation and new resolve, we dive into it again, hoping to produce something that we haven't had in the past, the kind of fruit we really want in our lives, the fruit we need in our lives. And at that point, what happens is we end up falling into what I call a toxic cycle. And you can see it here. The expectation of fruit, the reality of our barrenness, right? There ain't no fruit. The assessment of the judge. You need to do better in your life. Then, of course, the uh, reinforcing of our efforts. And then, of course, it just goes over and over and over again. We just go into a toxic cycle, and whether it's breaking a bad habit or hoping to start a new habit, a healthy habit, whether it's trying to get rid of a weakness or a character defect or maybe an addiction that we have in our lives, we get stuck in this negative toxic cycle over and over again. And I think as Christians, some of us have been in this for a long time. I know myself, I've fallen into this negative toxic cycle of uh, expecting, finding the reality of it, the voice of the judge, and then I'm going to work harder. And, you know, there is a name for this. They actually call it. It's, it's in the Bible. It's called the law, right? That is the law. All the rules and expectations of what are supposed to be happening in our life and all the fruit that we are supposed to be producing, it really is the law. I mean, Paul talks about it in Romans 8, 3. He says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. The law, you said, I thought the law was a good thing. It is a good thing. But the only good the law ever did was to remind us, to show us, to give us a revelation of how unfruitful we really are. How powerless we really are to live the standard that God has for us. All the law could ever do was show us all the places in our lives that where we were blowing it and not bearing fruit. We should be this and we should be that. But because of our own brokenness and sin, we, we just can't be what we should be. We just can't be. And you know, I don't have a lot of time, but all you have to do is read the Old Testament and you'll find that the children of God, the, the Israel, how many times did they vow before God that they would be his holy people and they blew it over and over and over again because they didn't have the power to do it. And this cycle keeps repeating itself over and over, and all we start to hear is the haunting voice of the judge that keeps saying to us, you're barren, you're fruitless, maybe you should just give up. It's a pretty, how many know it's a pretty dark and defeating place to live, amen? That is the bad news of the story, but... How many know the story doesn't end there? There's some good news. And, you know, the good news happens when suddenly um, another person enters the narrative in the story. And, of course, that person is the gardener. And I call that the entrance of the advocate. The advocate. Let's say that word together. Advocate. The helper. right? The strengthener. The mentor, the coach, you can give it all sorts of names. And when he comes, he is far more supportive and optimistic. And he has some suggestions. And uh, those suggestions come in three areas. He says, you know, the first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to cultivate, cultivation. He says, dig around that tree, that fruitless tree. Loosen up the soil, break up the hard and follow ground. Let's do that first. The next thing he does is he says, and then after that, let's do some impartation. In other words, let's give it some fertilizer, some additives. Let's introduce something from the outside that it doesn't have right now. That's the second thing he suggests. And then, of course, the third is let's give it some time. Let's not be in such a hurry. Give it a year. Give it some time. And that's what the advocate does, that he breaks what I call the close, barren system of the law. 
all its frailty and weakness. He breaks it by stepping in and imparting things that allow for growth and transformation to happen. And those things are cultivation, impartation, and time. Okay? This is how growth happens. And you know, this morning, what I want to do is get very practical with you. In fact, I want to share with you how this process has worked out in my own life. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing from my heart at this moment. You need to get ready, embrace yourself. Um, Because I'm going to just share my journey. You know, ever since I can remember, I've always had a problem with anger. And when I say anger, I'm not talking about the normal, natural, run-of-the-mill kind of anger that we all deal with. Uh, but my anger was, uh, was different. It, it had a very short fuse. Uh, it was kind of a lookout, raging kind of anger. And, you know, it's something I struggled with all my life. And, you know, th- that's why when at the age of 21, when I came to Christ, I was so excited. And one of the reasons for my excitement was because I thought, you know, hallelujah, this anger thing that gets hold of me, this uncontrollable anger, it's finished. It's, it's, it's going to leave my life. Because there were a lot of other things that left my life the moment I crossed the line of faith, gave my heart to Christ. Lots of things, things like my drug and alcohol uh, dependency, my propensity for partying. I, you know, I used to uh, have, 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 a, have a, a problem with, with swearing. All of those things, the moment I came to Christ, it's like they dropped out of my life. And so I had full expectation that my anger would leave right along with them. And yet over time, I found out that it didn't that it was lurking just below the surface, just waiting to raise its ugly head. And sad to say that many times it would. Um, uh, That even after I became a Christian, I'd get mad, I'd vent, I'd rage, and then I'd say things that I would regret. How many been there, done that? Amen. And then you think, oh my. What a shame. And, and, you know, your words hurt people. And it happened uh, over, and I would feel so bad. I'd ask God to forgive me, and then what would I do? I would reinforce my efforts. And I would vow and resolve to never do it again, only to repeat it a short time later. It was that toxic, closed cycle. And, you know, it was toxic. I took anger into my marriage. Uh, It seeped into my relationship with my kids. And it seemed like no matter how hard I tried, I could not get rid of it. And then one day, Clarice came to me with a teaching series that was on DVD. Matter of fact, it wasn't one DVD. It was five of them. And um, it was from a counselor. His name is Graham Bretherick. He's a, he's a Christian counselor in Lethbridge, but he is a phenomenal teacher. And this is an area that he specializes in. Matter of fact, he actually travels all around the world teaching on a variety of topics. This was one of them. And uh, she gave the DVDs to me, and I watched every one of them. Okay? And that took time and effort. How many know change isn't always easy? So I don't have time to change. Well, you need to make time to change. I watched every one of them. And, you know, in it, Graham talked about different kinds of anger. He talked about the anger that comes from God, the anger of the Lord. We see that in the Bible. He talked about the normal, natural emotion of anger, which all of us uh, have and, and should express in healthy ways, be angry and sin not. But then he also talked about the toxic, destructive kind of anger that causes so many problems. And that was the kind of anger that many times I dealt with. And um, in his teaching, uh, he ended it by saying that many times this uncontrollable anger, the kind I had, uh, oftentimes oftentimes was the result of unresolved hurt that a person has in their life. I had never thought of that before. You know, I just thought I needed to pray more 
or, you know, I just needed to be a better person. I had never connected the dots that maybe some of the anger that I was experiencing was, was linked to some unresolved pain. And so as soon as I heard it, it's like a, I had a light bulb moment. And I thought, well, maybe that's what's happening with me. Maybe I am carrying around some unhealed hurt. And that hurt is like acting, it's like a fuel for my anger. And so I meditated on that for a while. And then I finally had the gumption, or whatever word, the courage, the hunger, whatever word you want to use, to pick up the phone. And I called a therapist here in the city, and I made an appointment with them. And when I met with that person, um, they began to ask me questions I'd never considered before. Uh, they began to present scenarios that I had never thought of before. That's what we call digging, right? Remember the digging? The digging. Let's say that word together. Digging. Digging. Now you say, Pastor, I don't have time to dig. Well, we need to do some digging, right? If we want health and wholeness, maybe we need to do some more digging. And I'll tell you, he dug. He dug in my family of origin. He rooted around many of the closets that I had in my life. He gave me books to read and videos to watch, and although it didn't happen overnight, I want to say in time. Remember time? In time. I began to feel the force of that anger slowly losing its hold on my life. Until one day I realized that I had had an episode of toxic anger and rage for months. I just kind of looked back and I said, wow, I haven't had one of those for months. And I began to see that God's grace, his healing, was gradually doing a work of transformation in me. Now, you know, that was over 15 years ago now. And I want to say that I have never had a flare-up with toxic anger since then, 15 years. So, you know, if I was an alcoholic, I'd say I've been 15 years sober. 15 years sober, 15 years I've never had a flare-up. Now, that doesn't mean I don't get mad. Of course I do, just like we all do. It's natural to get angry, but I'll tell you, that natural anger never crosses over into the uncontrollable, destructive kind that I had struggled with for so many years. That's the change that took place in me, and it happened right? When I was willing to allow someone to come into my closed system and bring some things I couldn't bring myself. I took the plunge. I chose to open myself up to an advocate, someone who could heal me, help, help cultivate and dig and fertilize and enrich, and over time healing and transformation took place. Amen? That's my story. The question I want to ask you is, what's yours? Or do you have a story? We all need to have a story, a story of healing and transformation, right? A story of how some of the things that are deep-rooted in our lives get rooted out so God can transform and change us. Amen? Kind of quiet in here. Amen? Let me ask the question, how many want more fruit into your life? Oh, there's a few less. When you see the process, right? And so what we have here is uh, the first cycle is, uh, is uh, expectation of fruit, reality of my barrenness, the voice of the judge, reinforce my effort. Man, what a way to live the law. We need to break that cycle, and the way you do it is the entrance of the advocate, cultivation, digging around, going deep, not just talking about news, weather, and sports, and the price of masks at Sobeys. Amen. Deep. Let's say that again. Deep. And then, uh, of course, impartation, bringing something, allowing something to come into our life that we didn't have before. And then, of course, uh, what happens is time. We give it some time. 
And then, uh, and then what happens is we just keep doing it over and over and over again. That, that's the cycle. So I want you to think about a, a, a habit in your life, maybe a, a character defect in your life that isn't going away. You pr- tried to pray it away and fast it away and vow it away, but it's not going away. Maybe you need to have a different approach. You know what they say, the, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And maybe you need to try something different. And of course, Paul talks about that in Romans. Let's read it again. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. That's the bad news. The good news is, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the body's we sinners have and in that body God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins in other words what this is saying is we have an advocate his name is Jesus amen he's come to do for us what we can't do for ourselves we're powerless to do for ourselves And that he, if we invite him, will step into the closed system of our lives. And when he steps in, and maybe you're here this morning, you've never done that. In-house or online, you've never actually opened your heart to Christ. And Jesus, come and, and, and live in me. I make you leader and Lord. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't done that, to do it. That's the first step. Because when he comes, what does he do? He brings forgiveness. That breaks the shame and the guilt. He introduces grace. He takes away the voice of judgment that has been reigning and ruling inside of us. And he gives us what we can't do ourselves. He imparts to us what we don't have in ourselves. That's the role that Jesus plays. Of course, not only Jesus, but that's the role the Holy Spirit plays. Jesus said in John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Look at this. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That word declare there is more. It means more than just speak or tell, but rather it embraces the whole idea of an impartation. If you look up that word in the original language, it's not just talking about words. It's talking about a force that God imparts to us through the person of his Holy Spirit. That's what his spirit does. He is the great comforter and helper and advocate that has come to heal and mend us and free and restore us. Okay? But one other thing we need to understand is not only is that the the job of the Holy Spirit, but God also has a whole army of other folks uh, who he wants to send out to do that very thing. An army of healers and helpers that he sends out. You might say, well, what are the names? Who are they? Like, are they a group of of special anointed therapists? Who are they? Well, I'll tell you who they are. They are us, the church. Turn to the person next to you and say, I think he's talking about you. It's us, the church, the army of healers. The Holy Spirit anoints us He heals us and he anoints us to bring healing. I mean, Paul says it in Ephesians 4, 16, for his body, that's us, the church, have been formed in his image and is closely joined together and consistently connected as one, one, and every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love made perfect in love you know you can take that phrase made perfect in love and you can put change transformed healed restored how does God do it he does it through his body he doesn't just do it alone he does it through his body as we come together and impart to one another things that we could never receive in and of ourselves 
In other words, the only way we can break free of this barren, closed system that keeps us defeated and locked up is by inviting both Jesus and others into the far deeper, more intimate places of our lives. Now, most of us, we're okay with the Jesus part. You know, we're, we're good with that. It's kind of like God and me. We got a good thing going, right? Uh, most of us, myself included, we struggle with the others. Remember what I said, it's Jesus and others. We struggle with having the others dig around and go deeper in our lives. And of course, you see this all through the Bible. I don't have time. One, um, one, uh, one verse is confess your faults, James 5.16, to each other and pray for each other so that you might be what? What? Healed. How many here want to receive greater fruit in your life? Okay, we talked about that at the very beginning. Fruit, healing, restoration, change, transformation. How does it come? Well, it comes as we confess all our successes to each other. Is that what it says? Man, am I ever good at that. Did you, you want to know what I got on my, uh, my in university? How, you know, I just got a raise. You want to hear how great a husband, wife I am? How many of you know that? That doesn't go very deep. Healing, wholeness, transformation, and change happens around the table of vulnerability as we share our faults and failures and pray for one another. That our advocates are both God and others. And so the question I want to ask you is, are you ready to break the closed system and introduce some new people, advocates, Coaches, friends in your life who will bring you, bring in that which you don't have in and of yourself. You know, part of this material I'm sharing with you today comes from a course that's been created by psychologist Dr. Henry Cloud. Many of you have heard of him. Uh, in fact, the, the course that he teaches is called Churches That Heal. Uh, that's the name of the course. And so right now, as staff, uh, what we're doing as as staff of the church, is uh, we are going through this course um, uh, video by video. And along with the video, there's a workbook. And I'm telling you, the questions that in this workbook, man, I've never dug so deep in all my life, but we're going through this together as staff every Monday from noon till one. The guys stay with the guys, the girls stay with the girls. They go, we, we have our groups, and we talk about this stuff. Um, because we really believe that God is saying we need to get to a place of healing and wholeness. Right? Because God wants to uh, use us in, in tremendous ways in the hour in which we live. He wants to fill us with greater anointing and greater glory but if we have holes all in us it just goes in and comes out right we can't stay filled so God wants to heal us and mend us so as staff we're going through it and then the whole idea is to share it with the church family and that's exactly what I'm doing today that's what this series is all about we call it wholehearted uh, we're sharing it with you and then of course uh, our plan is that uh, from that we're going to be launching some connect groups uh, out of it, and of course, uh, the connect groups it comes with its own uh, material and, and 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 great stuff that go along with with a small group and so that 's sort of the plan that we have now, of course, with covid we don 't really know right connect groups, and you know what it 's like wow, um, but whether we meet in person. Uh, the plan is to launch a bank of them May tenth or we meet on zoom we 're committed to doing it. Amen. Because we believe that's how true healing happens. Matter of fact, this is something we be always believe. Matter of fact, one, one of our core values is this. We as a church will intentionally build environments where honest, transparent relationships will lead us into the process of ongoing transformation. That's one of our values. We only have five. That's one of them. 
And so we will intentionally build. Why? They don't build themselves. How many know that? They don't. You have to make, you have to prioritize it. You have to have a hunger. You have to say, God, enough is enough. I want to see this area, this unfruitful area of my life. I want it broken off once and for all. I want to be a fruit bearer in my prayer life, in my marriage, in my family. In my speech, in my attitudes, in my habits, God, I want change and transformation. And when the hunger for that exceeds the difficulty of getting there, you'll do it. Amen. That's what I had to do. And so that's the plan for all of us. And um, because we know one thing this pandemic has done is it's caused a... tremendous amount of isolation of separation of mental health struggles of all kinds and I really believe that God wants to step into those dark places those fruitless places those places of despair and addiction and depression and fear and do what we can't do by ourselves bring healing and grace amen and so the question I want to ask or close this morning is what's one area in your life right now one area where you need to invite our advocate Jesus through the Holy Spirit invite him and others into I want you to think about that because that's how true healing and growth and transformation happens. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. Just so powerful what God wants to do in and through us. You know, I'm reminded of a, of a scripture that just came to me. Job 14.7 For there is hope for a tree. If it be cut down that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease though its roots grow old in the earth and its stump die in the soil yet at the scent of water it will bud and put out branches like a young plant and I really feel like the Lord is saying to us this morning there's hope for all of us there's hope for our marriage and hope for our struggles, there's, there's hope for all the dark and discouraging things we go through. There's hope. God is speaking hope over his people in this hour. He says that the scent of water, water is symbolic of the person of the Holy Spirit. As, as, as God pours out a fresh anointing upon us, he revives us and gives us fresh hope and strength to do what we can't do in and of ourselves. Amen. And so, Holy Spirit, I want you to just lift your hands. Holy Spirit, come. We open ourselves up to you. We surrender ourselves afresh to you. We invite that you would come into these locked up places. And Father, we pray that you would give us the courage to invite trusted advocates, other people, to step right in along with you. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen.